Um, okay, so here we are in the purpose-built listening room at Magico headquarters with a lone wolf, the owner and designer of Magico, and he's sitting next, you can see over his shoulder, the uh, magnificent M9 flagship speaker. And we've had a tour of the factory. We've got a sense of a little bit more about what Magic is about. But I think the first question I would like to ask alone is simply this. Why are you different than other speaker manufacturers? What, what has been some of your priorities on the design front that maybe differentiates Magico from some of the other manufacturers out there in, in terms of uh, approach? Um, wow, well, that's a loaded question. So uh, <laughs> there is a lot, there's a lot to talk about. Um, I, uh, I've been building speakers for many, many, many years. And when I say many years, I can say now without exaggerating, it's, uh, it's over 40 years. I built my first uh, uh, kit, peerless kit when I was 16 years old. So um, at a certain point, you start, of course, understanding more and more how speaker works and uh, understanding the uh, uh, fundamental issues that the designs have. And uh, I was always uh, curious on uh, what can be done to solve uh, fundamental issues. Uh, and one of those issues uh, is, of course, a big issue, the enclosure, uh, which is typically built in a certain way that uh, I re realized early on is not quite uh, suitable for what it is that we're trying uh, to do building speakers, which is basically just having the, 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 the loudspeaker cone moving without anything else moving with it or without it exciting anything else. Um, this is, of course, after doing all the proper electrical work, etc. I'm just talking about uh, transferring uh, energy from one medium to another. And, and once you start uh, going down that uh, rabbit hole, and it is a, a deep one, you uh, eventually arrive at what you see here, which is a combination of uh, aluminum enclosure uh, with uh, uh, carbon um, uh, skins that uh, host the air inside the speakers. Uh, the old, question, the, the, the old uh, uh, subject of uh, driver coupling is extremely uh, critical to uh, to where do you fasten these these drivers? Uh, how much energy is lost via that process? Um, so I think uh, I'm not aware of uh, of too many uh, uh, that are doing that kind of work to the extent that we have. If you're asking about what's different, um, the company who builds uh, <coughs> these. Uh, uh, carbon structure for us, uh, uh, build structures for uh, 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 atomic, uh, 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 for nuclear submarine. So mm -hmm. you can kind of get a sense that uh, it needs to be quiet. And, and Lee, as you notice, uh, when we play these big bass uh, cuts and you put your hands on the, uh, perhaps you, uh, you want to share your experience with us. Yeah, there was a lot of bass energy in the room. The cabinet was completely inert. So that was kind of interesting. I thought there'd be some vibration or pulse. Um, not at all. Not even a whisper. So that there's something going on there. With it's, the, it's, it's, the it's, structure. it's an heroic uh, uh, um, effort to build something that can observe all this energy uh, without vibrating uh, at such level that will add um, uh, sound to the sound. And as you've seen, we can actually measure it now and see uh, what, uh, what the frequency response of an enclosure is and how much it does affect the sound if the enclosure is not built properly. Mm -hmm. So, you know, some might think that uh, um, I'm way over killing the subject, but I don't believe so. And, and I hope that, uh, Lee, you were able to hear what it is uh, when all you're hearing is a Pistonic uh, driver doing what it's supposed to do. Um, and that's a big differentiation, I, I, I believe, uh, in what we do. Of course, the uh, the level of effort that we put into uh, all the driver designs, uh, um, trying to achieve the optimal and ideal pistonic um, damped 
uh, um, cone structure possible uh, is uh, is also something that I think we uh, we kind of took to uh, to new heights. The use of uh, graphene was first uh, uh, was used by us. We've been using graphene for uh, I believe over ten years now, mm -hmm. uh, and of course the new uh, aluminum honeycomb that uh, increased the stiffness while reducing mass. Uh, all this kind of work really uh, does advance, I think, the overall performance and uh, differentiate us from uh, from quite a few other uh, um, manufacturers, I, I believe. Do you want to talk about the the tweeter and how that plays into all of this, as, as well as the, the crossover design and how that contributes to this effortless sound you're getting on the M9? Yes, uh, of course. Uh, again, just like with all the other elements that we've talked about, uh, Twitter development is uh, is a very daunting. In fact, that's uh, overall probably the most difficult driver to uh, to build, uh, mainly because of the tolerances and and the change that the minute changes that uh, one does that makes a big difference. But again, it's a similar uh, uh, proposition of uh, problems. Uh, you want to have a pistonic motion. Um, the more pistonic the driver gets, uh, the more difficult it is to create a dome out of it, uh, which affects the dispersion. Uh, it took us four years to actually develop the dome that we're using for uh, for uh, our speakers, and now it's used on all of our speakers uh, it's other than the S series. Um, both the A series and the M9 uh, and the M series all have those new uh, uh, 28 millimeter cones. Um, the diamond deposits increase stiffness and pushes the resonant frequency even higher. Uh, and as we spoke before, the, the, the idea of pushing the resonant frequency as high as possible is not because it's not audible, it's not in the audible range, it's because every time that these frequencies are getting excited, it actually affects the entire tweeter. So it doesn't matter uh, that uh, it's at 50k because it's outside of our audible range. No, it matters because at 50k there's very little signal that's going on. So the chances of of these uh, frequencies to uh, be agitated are very small, as opposed to a breakup that happens at uh, 25k. There was a lot of music there, uh, especially with high res digital these days, and of course with the vinyl uh, as well. So uh, so so yeah, this is uh, this is a, a big uh, area where we put a lot of efforts into. Um, and uh, it, it migrates as well to the crossover parts, as, as I showed you, uh, the, the size of the coils, mm -hmm. the entire concept of uh, minimum losses. Um, once you start saturating the parts uh, with, with signal, uh, these are all uh, contribute to, uh, to the overall results to very low uh, distortion level and um, the performance that, that you heard. Yeah, and I, I also took note of the thick boards you use in that crossover, the very, PCB board, very yes. rigid. Yeah, yeah. Um, the thing that also fascinates me, if we go back to the honeycomb design and trying to create that pistonic mid-range, that's actually available on the A5, mm -hmm. so you, you may not have to be a, a billionaire, so to speak, to uh, no, not to at enjoy all. the uh, benefits of your uh, research in that department. Yes, everything that we learn, we try to uh, trickle it down as much as possible. Some of the things are not possible to trickle down. Some are, like the aluminum honeycomb cone, which now the A5 has. Uh, same resistors, the M resistors, uh, which were first uh, used in the uh, in the M5, were actually. Uh, designated and, and were designed for the M9, but because of the pandemic, uh, turned out that the, uh, the, the A5 uh, was launched before the M9. But, uh, but a lot of the stuff we learned and developed for the M9 migrated itself uh, directly to the A5 at a fraction of the cost. Good. And it, well, earlier we went on a, a, a couple of tours to the factory, w one fairly in-depth. We've got video coverage coming from that. Um, well, a couple of things stood out to me. Alone, one is the uh, 
the measurements. You're doing some fairly advanced measurements with the, the clipple device and the, the laser vibrometer. Do you want to talk to us a, a little bit about how those are kind of changing the game in terms of the, uh, the efficiency in terms of what you can do much quicker than you would have been able with, say, an, an, an echoic room? Yeah. But also the um, how that benefits the... I guess in this case, you know, the uh, the testing of the final designs uh, and the structure of the cabinet. Yeah. Well, the the whole the whole uh, science of measuring loudspeakers is uh, is quite complex, deep, and and difficult. Uh, the, the the basics are quite clear. You want to actually measure what's coming out of the speakers without measuring the uh, reflective area that the speaker is in. So. Think about uh, a wavelength um, that is being generated from the speakers and needs to arrive at the microphone before uh, it hits anything else. Um, very difficult to achieve once you start going down in frequencies. If you think about the 20 hertz uh, uh, wavelength, it's, uh, I believe, 53, 57 foot. So in order to measure a loudspeaker down to that level, you need to have a free space, a free square space of 57 feet uh, uh, in each direction around that speaker. That's a pretty big and echoic chamber. <laughs> um, and uh, needless to say, very uh, difficult to uh, arrive at, uh, at a place like this. Most an echoic chamber are, are only good down to about 150 hertz or so because they're not that big. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very difficult to see below these frequencies what the speaker is actually doing. So you're always kind of guessing what, uh, what the response is without really knowing what it is. Uh, a, B, uh, you measure the speaker at uh, one point or perhaps several points uh, around in that space, but uh, it's, it's limited in capacity and kind of a challenging to get a good reading of 360 degrees of the dispersion pattern of what a speaker can, can do. Uh, the, the NFS, the Clipper system that you saw, uh, allow us to do that all here in-house. So for the first time ever, we have a system that shows us a complete pictures of what the speaker is doing down to 20 hertz at 360 degree uh, uh, scope. It's uh, it's mind-boggling in comparison to what was available uh, to us before. And it's uh, it's a game changer. I mean, we're seeing things we've never been able to see before mm -hmm. and are able to address things we were never uh, uh, able to address before. And now with the room uh, being as, uh, as, as, as balanced as it is, with minimum uh, room gain, uh, we could actually correlate between what we design, what we measure, and what we actually hear, uh, almost one-to-one. -one. And uh, that's a very, very pleasing uh, uh, place to be in, um, as opposed to designing something that sounds uh, great in your room, and then you take it to a different room, and it sounds a bit different, not quite as good as what you thought, mm -hmm. and you try to adjust for that. But then it's sounding completely different in that particular room and so on and so forth. And you never really know what's the proper uh, uh, design should have been to, to begin with. It's true. The speakers are still going to sound different uh, depending on the room it's going to be. But the rooms can change. The speakers cannot. So you better mm -hmm. get the speaker right. Mm -hmm. And then the rest is going to be up to you or the environment that you find yourself in. Uh, so, yes, it's a big step up for us in terms of our ability to design uh, a proper uh, proper speaker. Yeah. And then just a, a follow-up on the laser vibrometer. I was really impressed with how different you can... It's almost like a, what, a frequency, a dynamic look at what how the uh, yeah. baffle of the speaker is vibrating. Yeah. And there was a test case of an MDF, and it was moving quite a bit. I yeah. was surprised, actually. And then... The Magico mm -hmm. up against it, and no movement at all, very inert. Um, that must be informing you too, in terms of as you go to the carbon skins, as you move up the line mm -hmm. and product mm -hmm. quality. Yeah, um, that's got to that's got to be a great, very objective way to know whether you're on the right path or not with new materials. Uh, absolutely, and it also also allows to be very efficient in the way we we tackle things. So. 
if before we saw a problem, uh, it, it was difficult to tell exactly where the problem is. So you have to kind of uh, use thick uh, 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 brush strokes to, to deal with things that can be really minimal. Mm -hmm. and, and those correction are not uh, free lunch. They have their own cost uh, that associate with them. Uh, and I'm not talking about price, I'm talking about uh, performance. So being able to pinpoint the issues that needs to be addressed is, uh, is extremely important and uh, another kind of step forward in the overall uh, quality of the product. Yeah, and it also strikes me as we're sitting in this very um, custom built listening room, the amount of detail you go into in terms of having the cue pods and the M pods as footers, you've even gone as far as building your own version of an equipment rack with mm -hmm. constrained layer damping in the uh, shelves, even with a ground control rod as well on the back. It seems like there is a real effort to make sure you've nailed down any source of noise. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine that also gives you an ability to really zero in on, on what the speakers are capable of. You know, whether it's the M9s at the pinnacle here in the, in the room or, or maybe even a humble pair of A1s. Absolutely. They all, they all get the same treatment and the objective is the same. Uh, is how we arrived at, at the same objective and, and what kind of tools are uh, at our disposal to do that. So I might have less tools uh, when it comes to an A1 to deal with the issues at hand than I do with, let's say, an M9. But the, uh, the, 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 the objectives are the same. You really want to find the absolutely most efficient way to transfer forms of energy from electrical energy to mechanical energy with the least amount of, uh, of losses. Mm -hmm. And that and, 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 and noise is, uh, is a big factor of it. And how do you get rid mm -hmm. of it um, in the most efficient way that would allow you, the listener, to hear deeper into, uh, into the music. So if I might reflect on some comments and my experiences earlier today listening to the M9s in the room, a couple of things really stood out to me. You played some vocal tracks and I heard the chestiness of the vocals and all that really contributes to them sounding lifelike. And, on, and another aspect, there are really three things that stood out, I guess, particularly noticeable, <laughs> really a lot to talk about here, and I'll have a follow-up video, but the speakers disappear. And then the third thing is I think the dynamics are just world-class. So a lot of the stuff we've already talked about on this video obviously contribute to that, but is there a way as an audiophile we should think about vocal presence, speakers disappearing, and a lifelike soundstage being created? and dynamic range being accurately portrayed. Um, are there any things in the M9s that you feel an audiophile should know in terms of reaching those, you know, three, those, those three big factors that contribute to a, a, a natural sound? Well, I mean, I, I'm not sure I understand the question, uh, meaning we should all strive to that, but striving for dynamic doesn't necessarily mean anything in my mind, as opposed to how do I build uh, a structure that would allow the components uh, that are designed as well to perform at a certain level to do the best uh, job possible. Um, so it, it's, it's really a line of many different things that all have to line up in order for you to get the uh, so the end the result. So it's the cabinet being inert, it's the, the perfect pistonic performance of drivers. Yes. It's the crossover, yes. managing all that and yes. all those interactions. Yes, absolutely. It's everything. And uh, it's, it's, it's even hard to say what is the most important part because you can have these drivers and put them in a, in a, some sort of a lesser enclosure and, and it would not perform the way you heard it here. Uh, all these little things do, do make a difference. So um, you can't really skip or cut corners anywhere when you build something like, uh, like the M9. Of course, when it's uh, an A-series, you have to build uh, with restriction in mind. 
Um, and that's a challenge by itself. Uh, and the proof is in the pudding. I, I think we've done quite well with that. Uh, even though uh, our hands were tight for sure on many uh, on many subjects okay um, and I think just as a final question there seems to be a real air <laughs> there's something in the air here about constantly improving everything you do always looking for the next little sonic advantage the M9s are a singular achievement but you're not going to stop there if you figure out a better way to build that speaker I assume you're going to keep going. You're going to, you know, at some point there might be the equivalent of a M10 or something. You're not going to stop, are you? You you strike me as someone who's kind of pushing the envelope in a lot of areas alone. Yes. Any I, thoughts uh, about that in the future direction of the company? Yeah, I I can't say that I know right uh, top of my head how I can improve on the M9 at the moment. That's not to say that it's uh, you know not going to happen one day. But we really put everything uh, uh, we know how to or think there is to uh, the M9. Uh, so at the moment, uh, this is as good as we as we know uh, can be achieved. Uh, but yes, we are constantly looking for a better way to do things. And um, um, the bigger we get, the more established we get, uh, the more access we have to cool stuff that before or to a smaller company uh, is not easy to access. Uh, for example, the, uh, the the NFS robot that you've seen, this is a big investment. Mm -hmm. uh, the laser vibrometers, this is stuff that, you know, not everybody can, can actually buy. Uh, it's a big investment, uh, but it allowed us to do, to we, we are in a position we, when we can do stuff like that, that really uh, up our games uh, quite uh, quite substantially. So I suspect that uh, the longer we do that, uh, the more established we get, the more access we have to all sorts of cool stuff that would hopefully, um, you know, keep pushing the envelope. But but at the moment, uh, the M9, I think, represents uh, uh, the absolutely state of the art uh, um, capability and, and uh, level of, uh, of loudspeaker design. Thanks, Alon. Really appreciate your time and sharing a few thoughts with us. Thank you so much for your Thank time. Thank you, Lee, and thanks for coming and, and visiting. Okay.